orthopedic surgeon. So graduate from OU. It's all yours. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. I'm Brian Clowers. Uh, like Sally said, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I uh, subspecialize in disorders of the foot and the ankle, um, although I still take care of um, a fair amount of general orthopedics. Uh, foot and ankle is about 80% of what I do, so um, Sally told me we needed some education on uh, foot and ankle topics. So what I tried to do was um, put together some information on how to best examine and evaluate the foot and ankle in a clinical setting um, because those are going to be things that are, I'll tell you, orthopedic conditions, if you're working in a primary care setting or in an urgent care or any of those types of arenas, you're going to see a ton of orthopedics. Um, and foot and ankle, even though it's only one subset of that, you're going to see a ton of that too. Um, because just about every demographic you can think of has the potential to have foot and ankle conditions, whether it's young, healthy people that are out running 5Ks and doing all that sort of stuff and twisting their ankles, or older individuals, sick individuals that are you know, diabetic or have other medical conditions that lead to foot and ankle conditions, you're gonna see it. So um, I wanted to give you some overview of examination, radiographic evaluation, things that you would have the potential to be doing um, to try to evaluate these conditions, and then give you some sense of some treatment options and how you would go about um, addressing those issues for some of the more common uh, problems you're going to run into. If I tried to run through every foot and ankle condition, we'd be here for a year. Um, so I tried to give you some of the things that would pop up more commonly for you and that you're probably going to run into more frequently. Um, so those those were kind of some of the objectives that, that, that I wanted to cover. Uh, like I said, exam, radiographic evaluation, common injuries, and then common conditions. Um, a little bit about me, I did my medical school training at University of Oklahoma. Um, I did my residency at the University of Oklahoma. And then I went to Baltimore to complete a foot and ankle um, fellowship at the Institute for Foot and Ankle Reconstruction uh, with a guy named Mark Meyerson. Um, and then I came back here to start private practice with Oklahoma Sports and Orthopedic Institute. I've been with the group for about um, seven, a little over seven years now. So, um, so let's let's dive in. I think the first thing that I would want to do um, is kind of go over what my normal exam is for a foot and ankle. Um, and I think the easiest way to do that is to show you. I'm gonna run through some slides real quick, but then I was, I was volunteered a foot model. So um, what we'll do is we'll run through a, a, a quick exam. And what you'll see is that it takes me about three minutes to do this complete exam of the foot and ankle. It's, it's not a 30 minute evaluation, but if you do it systematically, you're going to pick up on most of the things that you need to be able to pick up on. So first thing we always look at when we see somebody is, is we just look at them. We do inspection tactics first. And so the generalized appearance of the foot and ankle, do we see swelling? Do we see skin changes? Um, I'll actually usually try to watch a person walk into my clinic before I even see them um, for two reasons. Number one, you need to see what the extremity looks like when they're actually using it. A lot of times you will look at feet or lower extremities, and this is critical in the weight-bearing extremity. Um, this is different than in the upper extremity, but in the lower extremity, you might see somebody sitting down and things look totally normal, and then you have them stand up and it's a completely different story. So anytime you're evaluating the lower extremity, if possible, you need to have them weight-bearing. Um, now, that may not always be possible if somebody's got a horrifically broken ankle, they're not going to stand on it for you. But if you've got somebody who's got more of a chronic condition or is capable of walking or standing, you need to observe them doing that. And the second reason I try to watch them before they get into my room is I don't want them knowing that I'm watching them because folks tend to do things differently when they know they're being watched. And so if you catch them walking without them knowing it, you're going to really understand what their gait looks like. Um, you want to look at overall alignment of the lower extremity. And so, yes, I'm a foot and ankle specialist, but I have to pay attention to a lot of other things. If somebody's got horrible valgus knees or horrible varus knees because of their bad knee arthritis, it's going to have impacts on their feet. So I need to understand the overall lower extremity alignment, not just the foot and the ankle. 
but I also need to pay attention to the foot and ankle alignment because you have plenty of people that have normal hip and knee alignment and have bad deformities of their feet. So you need to look both at the lower extremity as a whole as well as the alignment of the foot and the ankle. And this is usually the, the orientation I like to look at somebody is actually from behind. I get a lot more information about their overall lower extremity and foot alignment from behind than I do from, from the front. Um, and then you want to look for obvious things like deformity elsewhere, forefoot deformity. So you see a lot of folks who have big toe deformities, bunions, arthritic changes. You can see some of those deformities immediately when you look at them and you want to get a sense of what do, what do these things look like. Um, next thing I do is I always go on to a vascular exam. Um, so you want to, in the foot and the ankle, mainly palpate two main pulses, which would be the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial pulse. So you can see the diagrams of where those are most commonly found. Um, and it can take a while to, to pick up on where these are. It takes practice. Um, we always talk about how you need to see a hundred of something normal before you can pick up on something abnormal. So. That's why whenever you guys are doing clinical things, you ought to do these exams on everybody because even if they don't have a problem there, you need to get a sense of what normal looks like before you can start to pick up on abnormal. Um, you want to get a sense of how strong are those pulses, can you feel them at all. I don't have a Doppler, uh, you know, something that'll, that'll transcend those into sound for me in the clinic, but I can usually get a pretty good sense of if they have at least adequate macrovascular flow by palpating a pulse. You also want to look at capillary refill though too. That's an indicator of microvasculature. And so the best way to do that on the toes is to just get their toenails and press on them the same way as you would check on a finger to see is there a brisk capillary refill or not. Um, next thing I'll move on to is sensory exam. So you need to delineate between light touch and deep pressure when it comes to musculoskeletal exam. Um, a lot of folks who have neuropathy may be missing light touch sensation, but they may still be able to feel deep pressure. So you might, in a cursory exam, kind of press on their foot and they say, oh yeah, I can feel that. But you get a Sims-Weinstein monofilament out and they can't feel that. That's the difference between the deep pressure and the light touch. And that's particularly important in diabetics and folks who have neuropathy. You need to differentiate between those two. Um, and then you also need to pay attention to, are you looking at peripheral nerve distributions or root level distribution? So if you guys had a spine lecture yet, okay. Uh, and tell me if any of this stuff is not making sense, because I can uh, dive into this stuff um, uh, deeper if I need to. But you, there are two ways of looking at the sensory exam in the foot and the ankle. I tend to do more of a sensory peripheral nerve distribution because that impacts what I do more. Um, however, if you're examining the lower extremity, say for a spinal condition or a neurologic exam, you may want to pay more attention to root levels. And so you can see this map kind of maps out this, the peripheral nerve distribution, which is saphenous, deep and superficial perineal nerve, sural nerve, tibial nerve branches, and then uh, I think I caught them all there. Um, if you go to the root levels, you'll see here that the saphenous encompasses L3, L4, deep perineals L4, L5, Searles S1, S2. So you can, it's the same distributions, but it's a nomenclature issue. You need to figure out how are you going to document that and what's more important to you. Um, and there's some crossover there too. Um, next thing I'll move on to is a motor exam. So you want to check their motor strength. And for me, there's four main things that I look for, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion of the hind foot, and then inversion and eversion of the hind foot. Now once again, this can get convoluted as trying to break it up into root level versus peripheral distributions. For my practice and my usual care of folks, I'm more interested in the peripheral or the actual muscles themselves. I'm usually not as interested in the nerve distributions. Um, because I'm thinking of this more musculoskeletally as far as muscle groups rather than what their nerve innervations are, but you still have to pay attention to that. Um, so dorsiflexion, you're mainly checking the tibialis anterior muscle. Uh, plantar flexion, you're usually checking the gastrosoleus strength. Inversion, you're usually checking posterior tibial tendon strength. And then eversion, you're looking at the perineal strength. Now there's some crossover there. Perineus longus also plantar flexes the foot. But for the most part, perineals are everters, gastrosoleus or plantar flexors. Um, there's some specifics to some of these, particularly with inversion. So you have somebody that has posterior tibial tendon problems or deficiency, 
and you ask them to invert their foot, they can cheat on you a little bit if they have their foot up in a dorsiflex position. So that's the one test that you have to be specific when you tell them to invert their foot. Their foot needs to be completely plantar flexed. Okay? So you have them point their toes all the way down and then press against you inward. And that's the best way to isolate the posterior tibial tendon. So you'll get fooled all the time. You'll say, oh yeah, invert your foot and they'll do it just fine. They're cheating. They're recruiting their tibialis anterior as well. So that's kind of the only particular as far as an exam point is concerned on, on strength testing. And then um, you'll see I listed special testing down here, and, and that is very dependent on what the person is seeing you for. You're not going to do every one of these special tests on every patient uh, because it's just not necessary. <clears throat> if you have somebody coming in for a diabetic foot ulcer, you don't need to make sure that their ankle ligaments are, are okay. Um, so. Those tests, you kind of do at your discretion once you start to get a sense of well, what's the problem. Okay, I need to hone in on some of these things. So you'll see here, this uh, uh, illustration is of somebody doing a ligamentous exam, doing an anterior drawer exam to test ligamentous stability of the lateral ligamentous complex. Um, there are multiple tests you can do for the Achilles tendon to check for its integrity as well as if it is contracted or not. Um, but once again, and we can, if you have specific questions about any of those when we kind of go through the practical part of this, you can ask, but those are things that you want to do as you start to get a sense of what's wrong with the person. Um, the majority of the time I spend on somebody's exam is with this part here, palpation. So what I'm actually doing there is I'm kind of manually mapping out their foot with an image in my mind of a skeletal model of their foot. And so what I'm trying to do is press on structures, be it joints, bones, tendon insertions, tendon sheaths, peripheral nerves, and you're trying to get a sense of <clears throat> do people have pain at those locations. This is actually one of the things that helps me the most when I'm clinically evaluating somebody is to get a sense of geographically where is their pain located. Because once you have that, then you can start to correlate with radiographic findings. You're going to, and we'll show you some x-rays here in a minute. You shoot an x-ray, you're going to see all sorts of findings on some folks. Not all of them are pertinent. There are plenty of folks who have arthritic joints that don't bother them. You don't need to worry about those. If they're coming in for one specific area, you need to try to correlate those exam findings with, with where their symptoms are. Um, and then we'll move on to radiology. So let's take three minutes. You're still good for being football. Okay. Um, so let me just show you kind of my general way that I go about an exam. And like I said, you're going to see this takes very little time. Um, so if you want to just yeah, have a seat so everybody can see. My toes are can you sit on this one? Video. Can you the video? They like the video. So. Okay, yeah, wherever. Are you, do you need the table move? I can move the camera down. We're good. Yeah, if you actually just want to swing your foot up here that way, does that sit on all of our papers? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, first thing, like I said, watched you walk in. We know you're not limping. You don't have a, an abnormal gait. Um, Inspection-wise, let's say it's your right foot that you're coming in to be evaluated for. So we'll look at the foot. Do we see any swelling? Do we see any bruising, erythema, obvious deformity? Answers to those are all no at this point. Um, but those are kind of some of the things that you want to look at. Um, so once I've had a chance to get a sense of what's going on here, then we'll start with um, a vascular exam. So you can feel a dorsalis pedis pulse right here. If you come over on the back side of the medial malleolus, you usually will feel the posterior tip. Just because somebody has one doesn't mean they're going to have the other. It is possible to get isolated peripheral vascular disease in one or more of those vessels. So you need to check them both. And then, like I said, capillary refill, if their toenails are painted, <laughs> that can be a little bit harder. But if you just take your fingertip and kind of push on the end of the great toe, you can see how it'll blanch, and within two seconds it's back. So like we talked about, macrovascular and microvascular assessments there. Um, next thing we'll move on to is sensation. So I usually check six different peripheral locations. So I'll say, can you feel me touching here? That's deep perineal nerve. Can you feel me here? So that's superficial perineal nerve. Over here, saphenous. Over here, sural nerve. And then on the bottom, I'll use two fingers, one medial and one lateral. Feel both of those. So that's medial and lateral plantar nerves. Those are branches of the tibial nerve. 
So that's your sensory exam. Now, like I said, if you have any suspicion that somebody has neuropathy, that light touch, you may still feel that if you're missing light touch sensation because you're feeling the deep pressure portion of that. So if, if there's a suspicion of neuropathy, you need to do a more of a monofilament test to make sure that it's not only deep pressure that they're feeling. Um, next thing we'll do is the motor exam. So what I'll have you do is try to pull your foot up as hard as you can up towards your head. So they should be able to resist you completely, not, and you shouldn't be able to break them. That's normal uh, motor strength. I usually grade that, and you'll see it graded on a one to five scale. Um, the threshold for me, if you can move your foot against gravity, you at least have three out of five strength, okay? Two out of five strength indicates that there's motion of that joint, but you really can't push on it at all. So if you can at least move it yourself, it's three out of five. If you can move it, but I can break you, it's four out of five in my mind. And then if you can pull hard and I can't break you, then that's five out of five. Okay, so that's a good way of kind of keeping it clear in your mind. So that was dorsiflexion. We'll have you go plantar flexion, so push hard there. Good. While you're pointing down, I'll tell you, keep pointing down, push over towards the inside. So that's the true test of the posterior tip. So pull your foot up. Now pull that way. You can still do it, but what you see here is you can see that your tib ant's firing really hard and your posterior tib's not. Now point down again, push hard again. You can feel your posterior tib now firing a lot more, so you've got to get them to plantar flex the foot to test the posterior tib. And then I'll have you go E-version, try to push out against me. Good. Now, the last thing I'll sometimes check if I'm doing a root level evaluation is I'll have you do big toe dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So pull your big toe up, good, and then push down. So that gives you those S1, S2 distributions as well. Um, then once we've done that, I'll do more of a range of motion exam. I didn't mention that, but you will need to evaluate how well these joints move. So the range of motion that I look for is dorsiflexion of the, of the ankle. So ideally, somebody ought to be able to get to about 10 to 15 degrees past neutral with their knee extended. If you have somebody who's tight and then you flex their knee and they can get up higher, that's an indicator of a gastric nemius contracture, which is important for us in a lot of cases. You also want to check plantar flexion. You ought to be able to get about 35 to 40 degrees of plantar flexion. And then with the foot in neutral, I'll do an inversion and eversion. So that's isolating the subtalar joint. And then I'll hold the subtalar joint steady and do a transverse tarsal joint motion. So that's through what's called the talonavicular and the calcaneo cuboid joints. And then at this point, I'll do some of those special tests if we need any of them. So if somebody's come in with ankle instability, then you can do anterior drawer exam and a varus stress test. If they're coming in because you think their Achilles tendon is hurt, you can have them do what's called a Thompson's test, where you're squeezing on their calf to get that foot to move. So there's all of those special tests you can do at this point. Um, and then the last thing I'll do, like we talked about, is the mapping. So if, if we're still trying to figure out where the problem is, I will just start simply palpating all around the ankle and the hind foot and work my way all the way down and see if I can find any tender spots. So we'll be looking around the ankle, subtalar joint, tendons, down to their insertions, joints across the top of the midfoot, joints in the forefoot, all of those things and you'll just make your little mental map all the way down and usually by that point you've either hit a sore spot or found muscle weakness some deficiency that you'll get a sense of okay this is where the problem is and now we can start to move forward in the evaluation okay any questions about any of that all well, that makes sense okay all right so you've looked at their exam um, my next step is then usually a radiographic exam, and I x-ray just about everybody. It is probably 98% of my patients get an x-ray. Uh, a lot of people come into my clinic with x-rays, and I repeat them because in most cases, x-rays that are taken, say, in the emergency room or even in the urgent care setting, a lot of primary care offices are going to be done non-weight-bearing. Those x-rays give me very little information for the same reason that a CDIC exam gives you very not complete information uh, about a lot of the lower extremity issues. So I like to get weight-bearing images of the foot and the ankle. Um, if somebody comes in with weight-bearing images, I'm cheering. I think it's awesome, but in most cases they're not. 
Um, my usual series are a, um, let me skip ahead one here, a three view of the foot and a two view of the ankle. So these are the two views of the ankle that I usually get. The first one is an AP view. This is a straight AP view. The second one is an oblique view uh, with the foot being placed into slight internal rotation. Okay. These show you different things. Um, you're wanting to look for overall alignment. Obviously, we're looking for blatant things like broken bones, dislocations, those types of things. But also, you can get a sense of alignment. You can get a sense of arthritic change. How do these joints look? Do you see normal joint space? Do you see any sclerosis of the subchondral bone? That's an indicator of arthritic change. Do you see any osteophytes, bone spurs around the joints? That's a sign of arthritic change or chronic injury. Um, the oblique view gives you a little bit better view of the hind foot. So you can see here on this AP view, you're mainly seeing the ankle. That's, the, that's what you're picking up on there. Over here, and this one's slightly over-rotated, but I kind of like it that way. I tell my techs to do it that way because it gives me a really good look at the subtalar joint as well. Um, you can get a better sense of the lateral gutter of the ankle as well as the syndesmosis. Um, and you can see almost the entire calcaneus on this view. Um, and then we'll move on to the three views of the foot. So this is an AP view of the foot. This is an oblique view of the foot. Um, same thing, we're looking for alignment, we're looking for articular surfaces, we're looking for any changes to the bones, um, any malpositioning of the bones. You've got sesamoids under the big toe um, that can be important when you're looking at deformity and hallux valgus. And a lot of these things are subtle findings. Like I said, you're not, I'm not expecting you to pick up on everything just by looking at an x-ray the first time. But, X-rays are the same as the exam. The more of you look at, the more you're going to start to pick up on abnormal things. So you need to look at X-rays. Even if you're seeing somebody for something completely different, if they come in with those X-rays, look at them. Just so you can start logging those X-rays and views, because the more of that you do, the more um, discerning you're, you're going to get as far as looking at films. And then this is the lateral view I get. I like to get a lateral view. Um, that encompasses everything because this allows me to see the ankle. It allows to see the entire alignment of the, of the foot ranging from the hind foot to the forefoot. Now if we go back, um, there are some stress exams that I will get as well. Once again, these are situational. They usually are in the setting of an injury, uh, like a low energy injury to the ankle. Um, so I will sometimes do um, varus stressed or anterior drawer exams of the ankle under x-ray. So you can see here this is an example of an anterior drawer and this person has a blatant instability. You can see that the talus is no longer sitting completely under the tibial plafond any longer. Um, this is a varus stress test looking for similar things, instability. So instead of seeing an ankle like this that is perfectly aligned, you see an ankle like this under stress that shows a lack of integrity of the lateral ligaments. There's also a stress view of the ankle called an external rotation stress view. That's where you're mainly paying attention to this joint here, the syndesmosis, which we'll cover here in a little bit once we talk about those injuries. Um, and then there was also another one I listed called pronation abduction. That's for a midfoot injury. You guys may have heard of something called a Lisfranc injury. That's a common midfoot injury, and that's the stress view that you get uh, to assess for a, a Lisfranc injury. But we'll, we're going to cover that here in just a few minutes as well. Um, I didn't put a whole lot of information about advanced imaging in this talk, like MRI, CT scan, ultrasound. Those things are all things that you may run into. Some of your patients may have them when they come to you. Um, those studies are usually, I'm ordering them for extremely specific reasons. I wouldn't say that an MRI or a CT scan is a initial imaging study to get. Um, in most cases, if you're seeing somebody for the first time for a foot and ankle problem, plain x-rays are going to show you a good chunk of what you need to see. It's only when you start to get a little bit deeper into their treatment, if they're not uh, responding favorably, that's when you start going to those advanced imaging studies. But I'm not telling you you can't order those studies, but I would tell you that you don't have to start by shotgun ordering an MRI on it. So that's kind of the evaluation portion of this. Let's move on to some of the conditions that you're going to run into. So sprains, when we talk about a sprain, 
Um, and you'll hear me harp on this a lot. Nomenclature is important. Um, words are important about these things because you're going to have patients use a lot of different words when they come into you. They're going to tell you because they've been on Google and they've learned about what their problem is. And this is what I did. Well, okay, that's fair. I'll listen to what you're saying, but you also need to evaluate those folks with a clean slate. Uh, you, you can't let yourself get uh, clouded by those those things because immediately if they start telling you those things, you, you kind of start to get tunnel vision. You need to look at this with a clean view. Um, when I talk about a sprain, I'm talking about an injury to a ligament. Um, and that's, that's the most commonly accepted definition of that. The main ligaments that we deal with um, in, in my line of work would be the ligaments about the ankle, and there's three main complexes. The lateral ligament is complex, which is the most commonly injured one. If you've ever come down wrong playing basketball and, and twisted your ankle towards the inside, you have injured those lateral ligaments. Um, the syndesmosis, which we'll go into a little bit more anatomy here in a minute, but that's the joint between the tibia and the fibula at the ankle joint. And then the deltoid ligament complex is on the medial side of the ankle. And then we'll also get into the midfoot ligaments a little bit. So acute lateral ankle sprains, um, this, is the, this is what you see. You know, somebody's playing basketball or you're walking on the curb and you miss the step and you invert your ankle. <coughs> Um, and what this does is it's a, it's a stretching injury to those lateral ligaments. Now, these ligaments are not like your ACL in your knee. This is not a rope that tears in two and doesn't heal back. The lateral ligamentous complex is a very dense, thick portion of the joint capsule or joint lining. So what that means is that it and we'll get to treatment in a minute, nine times out of 10, we treat those injuries conservatively. It's very rare that I get somebody to surgery for that injury alone. Um, this is a decent diagram for didactic purposes, but I'll tell you, when you are doing surgery on these folks, it looks nothing like this. Um, there are not these nice little discrete bundles of tissue that are the ATFL and the CFL. This is all one big sheet of tissue and a reflection of tissue. So it's good to know where these things are because there are bundles that are denser than others there, but it doesn't look like this. Um, the two most important portions of this ligamentous complex are the ATFL and the CFL. Um, the ATFL mainly resists anterior translation of the talus from underneath the tibia, so that's that stress view we showed where it wasn't doing its job. Um, it also resists inversion a little bit, um, but it's mainly an anterior translation resistor. And then the CFL is more of an inversion resistor, so it, it prevents more of that uh, varus stress or that inversion moment. The PTFL is also a part of this complex. It serves a minimal purpose of lat lateral ligamentous stability. It's about 5% of the picture. Um, these are static stabilizers. So ankle stability is not just a, um, a ligamentous issue. It also has to do with your muscular tendinous function. So your perineal tendons and your posterior tibial tendon are dynamic stabilizers of your ankle. So the way I explain this to folks is that I, I look at these as the seat belt. This is what keeps you from coming completely out of the chair. But your hind foot musculature is what your brain uses to keep your foot in normal alignment. So the two things work in concert. Okay? Um, when you see somebody who's had an ankle sprain, they're going to have kind of a picture like this. You'll see a lot of swelling in, in a lot of these acute injuries. Not all the time will it be this diffuse, but it can be. Some of these injuries can look pretty gnarly. Um, and you're gonna, you'll are gonna, you see them, you say, oh my gosh, we're going to find fractures all over the place. Nope, you get an x-ray, it looks totally normal, and it's just a soft tissue injury. But it can generate a significant amount of bleeding, which is where the bruising or the ecchymosis comes from. That ecchymosis follows gravity, it's rolling downhill, and so that's why you'll see it down in the toes a lot. You know, it won't just be isolated up here around the ankle, it'll, it'll go, and that's where the swelling goes as well. Um, you will usually have tenderness isolated over the lateral side, but you may have tenderness in other places. I always get plane radiographs of these folks because not every ankle sprain is the same. You will have some sprains that are isolated um, ligament injuries. 
you will also have sprains that have other pathologies. So this x-ray, and it's subtle, but if you look closely, you can see that there is a minimally displaced fracture of the anterior process of the calcaneus. Doesn't need surgery, but that may be something that makes this injury linger a little bit longer than if it was a garden variety ankle sprain. So it's important when you're counseling the patient on, oh, how long is this going to take me to get back to playing sports? This one might take a little bit longer. Um, this is a fifth metatarsal base fracture that you could see with that type of inversion moment. We talked about the perineals functioning. So when your ankle starts to roll on you, your brain recognizes that and tells your perineal tendons to turn that foot back around. Well, if the foot's anchored on the ground, now all of a sudden that tendon is pulling on a fixed object and you can get avulsion injuries or injuries like this to the fifth metatarsal. Um, this is another subtle finding very small lucency in the Taylor Dome that's consistent with an osteochondral injury or a cartilage injury inside the ankle. So if you have somebody who has a significant inversion moment to the ankle, the talus can basically bang into the medial malleolus and cause a cartilage injury there and this can be a, a radiographic finding that's correlating with that. So that's why I shoot x-rays on all these. We're not going to find fractures or bony injuries on all of them, but you will on some of them. Um, the initial management of these injuries, your main goal right off the bat is to try to knock down the inflammation. You want to get the swelling and the inflammation down. So we're going to immobilize these. I, I, it drives me nuts when I see people coming from the ER and, and uh, they'll, they'll hop in on crutches but they've got nothing on their foot. It's big and swollen, looks awful, and you say, well, did they put a splint on you? No, they said my x-rays look fine. Okay, just because you don't have an abnormal x-ray doesn't mean we need to treat we don't need to treat you. You still have inflammation. So I will always put these folks in a fracture boot if I can. If, if we can't get a boot for them, put them in a splint. Put them in something that's going to limit their motion so that we can get the inflammation down. Um, icing. I tell folks to ice these aggressively. And you always have patients say, well, what do I do? Ice or heat? What do I do? Um, ice is usually the answer for me. There are some conditions where I tell folks to use more moist heat, but ice is going to help with inflammation nine times out of ten. Um, limitation of weight bearing. You don't have to keep these folks off of these injuries, but for a lot of people, for a few days, it's going to hurt too bad to walk on them. So give them crutches, give them a knee scooter, give them something to get off the foot so that they can rest this and let some of this inflammation go down. Because it doesn't do any good, even if they don't have a bony injury, if that swelling and inflammation persists for three weeks, they're not going to feel good, they're not going to get better. Um, and they can't move on to the next step, which is the rehab. If they can't tolerate doing the rehab, they can't do it. Um, Anti-inflammatory medications. I use these liberally. Now, you have to be cautious, folks who have, you know, gastric issues, kidney disease. Um, you have to be careful with some people. But in most cases, folks can take some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for a little while. Um, if you have somebody who can't tolerate non-steroidals, I'll give them a Medrol dose pack, a little short course oral steroid. Do something to try to mitigate that inflammation. Okay. Once I get somebody, yes, go ahead. I have a question for more of like the pain. So if you have a uh, lateral ankle sprain and it's inverted, mm -hmm. why would you have pain on the medial side of your ankle? Right, so there could be multiple reasons. Number one, I always explain it that the foot and ankle is, is very limited real estate. There's not a whole lot of room there. So it doesn't take much swelling to irritate everything. That amount of swelling that we saw in that picture will cause everything to hurt. Those people will come in and they'll be saying that their toenails hurt. Everything hurts because of the swelling. So you may get pain on the medial side. The other reason that could happen is because the ankle joint is like a water balloon. It's got a closed capsule. And so if you get swelling inside the joint, it's gonna hurt everywhere around the joint. So even though the ligaments were mainly hurt laterally, that joint capsule is still getting stretched medially, and so you may have pain in multiple locations. Yeah, that's a good question though. Um, once I get folks weight bearing, then I wanna try to get them out of the boot and into a functional brace. Um, the brace is, is a useful tool for me, not because I think their ankle is just going to fall apart, but if I've had them in a boot for a couple of weeks or if they've been off their foot for a couple of weeks, their muscles are going to be deconditioned. Stack that on to the fact that they stretched out their ligament and their ankle is going to feel wobbly. So I like to give them some support as we try to advance their activities. 
And then we want to get some physical therapy going. I use physical therapy liberally as well. So even for a garden variety ankle sprain, I would argue that folks would benefit from doing a short course of physical therapy, even if it's just going one or two visits and getting set up with a home protocol uh, to work on on their own, that's fine. But you've got to strengthen those muscles back up again. You also need to work on balance and functional activities. It's not just strengthening the muscles, it's getting them to do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. Okay. Um, if I have folks that are unable to progress by six weeks after their injury, that's when I start thinking about getting an advanced image, like an MRI, to figure out why aren't you getting better. And in a lot of those cases, we're going to find a bony contusion, osteochondral injury, tendon injury, something that's holding them up. Okay. Um, deltoid injuries are much less common than lateral ligamentous injuries. They can still happen in isolation, but in most cases, I'm seeing deltoid injuries in conjunction with ankle fractures or other injuries. So I bring it up, you treat them very similarly to the lateral ligamentous injuries. You're still going to immobilize those folks, rehab them, anti-inflammatory things. I do feel that deltoid injuries tend to do a little bit better. It's a more robust layer of tissue, so it's got a better capability of healing. Even though the lateral ligamentous complex heals really well, I think the deltoid heals a little bit better. This is a diagram of that. There's four components of the deltoid. The two most uh, important are the deep and the superficial. Um, and then there's a, a posterior and an anterior component, but the deep and the superficial deltoid are the most important uh, components of this. Um, main restraint to valgus instability, so there's not as much translational control here, but main uh, resistor to valgus instability. Um, as I said, the majority of these injuries that I see that need something are in conjunction with an ankle fracture. So you have a rotational ankle injury that causes a fracture and that puts additional stress on the deltoid and causes it to tear. Um, in most cases, I'm not having to repair the deltoid. If you get the deltoid in the correct tension or in alignment, it'll tend to heal pretty reliably. And then you heard me mention the syndesmosis. So the syndesmosis is the joint between the tibia and the fibula. Um, this ligament complex actually runs all the way up the length of the lower leg up to your knee. Um, the interosseous ligament, which is one component of that, is the part that runs all the way up the leg. It's a very dense and strong ligament complex. Um, it's got these two, one anterior and one posterior uh, component, the interosseous ligament, and then one, a small component called the uh, inferior transverse, which is a little less important. Um, it takes a fair amount of force to to injure this ligament complex. Um, this is the complex that gets hurt when you hear of somebody having a high ankle sprain. That's a term you'll hear thrown around. You know, I had a high ankle sprain. It took a lot longer to heal that one. Um, the reason is, is it's a, it's a different animal than a pure lateral ligament injury. Um, the function of the syndesmosis is to allow the talus to move up and down in the ankle. So this is a diagram of the dorsal surface of the talus, lateral and medial here. And you can see that the anterior portion of the talus is much wider than the posterior portion of the talus. So when you bring the foot up into dorsiflexion and the anterior portion engages the joint, that syndesmosis expands slightly. When you plantar flex your foot and the narrower portion is in the joint, it contracts. So it's very important to allow that normal motion, but it also provides an additional restraint to that joint. If the syndesmosis isn't there and the, the tibia and the fibula have the ability to do this, that impacts loading on the talus significantly. Um, so this is an image of somebody who had a quote unquote high ankle sprain. It's usually an external, this is normally a rotational injury. So your foot's planted and you turn or somebody steps on your foot as you're turning um, and you rotate through the tibia and the fibula and that'll cause a tearing injury to these ligaments. Um, we commonly see it in conjunction with bony injuries just like the deltoid. Doesn't mean it has to be that way. One of the more common bony injuries you'll see, you may have heard something called a Masonu fracture which is a fracture of the fibula up by the knee. If you see that on an x-ray, you have to look at the ankle joint too. Okay, uh, because this is like a pretzel. Um, I always use that analogy. You try to break a pretzel in one place. You can't really do it. If you break it in one, it's going to break somewhere else too. So 
you have to look for that ligamentous injury if you see that high fibula fracture. Um, in most cases, we will treat isolated injuries of the syndesmosis conservatively. Um, the only time that you would fix a syndesmotic injury in isolation is if you have gross instability. So if you can prove that that syndesmosis is not competent on an external rotation stress view, those are the ones that you're going to tend to fix. Now, stable injuries, you're going to treat the same way as those other ankle sprains, but you usually have to treat them that way a little bit longer. So whereas I, you know, a regular ankle sprain, I'll try to get folks up and walking immediately. I may keep someone off of this for a couple or three weeks. I may even keep them off of it for six weeks. Um, it's a much longer recovery for this type of injury. Uh, we have to protect their motion a lot longer with this injury, so you have to have them uh, in the boot longer, and it's a much slower return to play as well. Um, unstable injuries, this is where you end up getting to operative fixation and there's multiple ways to fix these. I didn't get into too much surgical detail here, but um, you, you can see here that we've not only got a screw going across the syndesmosis, but also this device called a tightrope, which is buttons with a dense suture in between them to keep those ligaments in the anatomic alignment so that when they scar, they heal in the correct length. That's the thing about most of these ligamentous injuries around the ankle. You're not doing a whole lot of things to replace that ligament. You're asking that tissue to scar in and regain stability that way. So in most cases it works, but those are where usually the failures occur is if that scarring mechanism doesn't complete the right way. Um, talked about Lisfranc injury. This is one that, that'll sneak up on you. Um, it's a very easily missed injury. In fact, I, I remember reading an article a couple of years ago. I think this was the second most litigated injury in orthopedics. Um, I can't remember what number one was, but this was, this was number two. Um, this is usually a result from a hyperextension moment on the midfoot. So you see this a lot in football players who are running into the scrum and they've got their foot planted on the ground and, and pushing off with their toes and then somebody comes behind them and lands on the back of their heel and compresses that midfoot into the ground axially. Um, what this involves is some... Sorry. Const some constellation of either pure ligamentous injuries or sometimes you get bony injuries as well. But the, the main ligament that we're worried about here is the Lisfranc ligament. It's on the bottom of the foot, same as those ankle ligaments. It's not a discrete structure. It's a thick spot of the joint lining. But it goes from this bone, the medial cuneiform, to the second metatarsal base. Um, and so when we see these injuries, they are oftentimes very subtle. You might look at this x-ray, which is a weight-bearing x-ray, and say, eh, it looks pretty normal. But if you look critically here, you can see that the gap between the metatarsal base and the cuneiform is a little bit widened, and you can see that this border of the metatarsal does not line up perfectly with the border of the cuneiform. It is displaced by a couple of millimeters, and that's key. That is important. Yes? Do you usually x-ray both feet just so that you Yes, comparison x-rays are excellent things to do. You've got, that's the great thing about orthopedics is you usually got a built-in control to compare it to. So um, I oftentimes <laughs> shoot bilateral x-rays, especially on things like this, because if you see an x-ray like this, but it looks exactly the same on the other side, okay, maybe that's the way that they're built. You see this compared to the other side, and this is lined up spot on with that cuneiform, and this one's off a little bit, that raises your antenna. Absolutely get comparison x-rays, okay? Now you may have to justify those in your documentation because if an insurance company sees you ordering bilateral x-rays and you only code for a right-sided condition, they say, well, why are we paying for an extra set of x-rays? You have to document in your note uh, on that visit, I ordered these x-rays for comparison, and they will usually be covered in that regard. Okay? That's an important point. Um, this is a sign that's important to look for for this injury. Plantar ecchymosis is a hallmark. You won't see it on everyone, but you will see it a lot. It prevents very similar to ankle sprains. So I see a lot of these that are missed and they'll come to me and they say, well, they shot x-rays of my ankle. Yeah, they weren't even looking at the right part, but it was because the whole foot and the ankle was swollen um, that you end up missing this injury. 
um, and you want to get weight bearing x-rays if possible some folks won't be able to tolerate that and that's where we do the pronation abduction stress view um, I can show anybody that that wants to see it basically what you're doing is you're grabbing onto the big toe and you internally rotate the big toe and then twist the foot over to the side towards the lateral side okay so what you're trying to do with that x-ray is you're trying to take the big toe and force these metatarsals laterally to see if this gaps open. If it stays put, the ligaments are usually competent. If it doesn't, you know they're hurt. Okay. Um, stable injuries, you know, folks, you can sprain these ligaments just the same as you do um, ankle ligaments. And those, if the foot is stable, if the joints are lined up where they are supposed to be and are staying that way, you can treat those conservatively. They just need to be immobilized and protected for a while. Unstable injuries, these are injuries that I would argue need to be fixed. Um, and you can fix these one of two ways. You can do what I've done here, which was in a younger individual with a subtle injury that we uh, operative, operatively aligned and held provisionally while those ligaments heal. There's a lot of motion towards actually fusing these joints primarily in um, certain instances for Lisfranc injuries because we know they're at a high rate of getting arthritis post-traumatically. So. Um, there's multiple ways you can treat that, but that's that's for another another discussion. Um, fractures. Here we go on time. We're not doing that. Okay. Um, fractures of the foot. So there are 26 bones in the foot. Uh, 27, if you include the end of the tibia, and all of them can break. So I think the foot in most instances is a very difficult structure to understand and fractures are no different. I mean, we take care, orthopedists in general, we take care of all sorts of broken bones, but I, I always say that, you know, the foot and the hand are particularly challenging because, you know, if you break your tibia, well, that's pretty easy to pick out and, and usually pretty easy to figure out what to do with it. 26 bones in the foot and some of them are incredibly small some of them have very limited blood supply I mean it can be a very challenging place to not only treat but also diagnose they're easy to miss um, some general management principles because we're not going to sit here and go over all 26 <laughs> bones and show you how they could break um, but a lot of the management principles are uniform across the board of how you treat fractures so when I think of fractures, the first question I want to answer is, do I need to operate on it or not? Will it, will it heal okay if I leave it alone or do I need to fix it? And there's some things that come into that decision-making process. So is the fracture displaced? Bone likes to heal under compression. Um, it has a hard time jumping big gaps. It can jump small gaps because there are two ways that bone heals. One way is called primary bone healing, which is where the two pieces are directly compressed against each other. And then there's something called secondary bone healing, which is how most fractures heal with what's called callus, which is a big wad of immature bone that starts as cartilage. Okay, So they don't always have to have their fragments touching, but they can't be just blown apart. You're not going to see bone leap a, a centimeter gap and heal all of a sudden. So displacement is something I pay attention to. Alignment, especially in the lower extremity, is critical because if you can tolerate small amounts of malalignment, some bones tolerate more than others, but you can't tolerate, say, a um, ankle fracture where that has your ankle pointing 30 degrees the wrong way. That's not gonna do well for you because all of those bones, especially the ones that make up joints, are covered with cartilage. Cartilage is particularly thin. Uh, the ankle cartilage, say the cartilage on the top of the talus, is about two millimeters thick. That's all that's keeping your ankle joint from getting arthritic. So if you have a few degrees of malalignment and now all of a sudden that joint starts eccentrically loading some of that cartilage, it's going to wear out very quickly. So alignment is very critical. Um, and then involvement of a joint surface. So in the foot and the ankle, you saw how many joints there were. Um, a lot of these fractures get into those joints. Joints don't do well if they heal with a significant step off or an incongruity. Those joints move like ball bearings do. They like to have nice smooth bearing surfaces. If you've got a big step off, 
Now all of a sudden you've got this cheese grater working every time you try to move your joint and it tears up the cartilage and you get arthritis. So involvement of the joint surface is a big part of deciding if these need surgery. So let's say you've got a fracture that is uh, minimally displaced, not terribly uh, badly aligned and extra articular, doesn't involve a joint. You think you can treat it conservatively. So if you get to that step in the algorithm, if surgery isn't needed, so what do we do to get this to heal? So you need to do a couple of things to help that bone. The bone's going to do most of the work for you. It knows how to heal itself. Um, but there are some things that you need to do to help it. So immobilization versus protective motion. Some things heal better if you allow them to move a little bit. Some fractures do better if they are rigidly immobilized. So the usual rule of thumb that I use there is if a fracture um, is minimally displaced, um, doesn't have a whole lot of what's called comminution. Comminution is broken into lots of little pieces. Um, generally stable fracture patterns, those are going to do a little bit better if you at least allow them to move. So those would be the people that I'll put them in boots. So the boot's protecting them, but I'll want them taking the boot on and off to do a little bit of protective motion. Let's say you've got a comminuted fracture that doesn't have a whole lot of stability, but it's still lined up pretty well. Um, those I'm probably going to be a little bit more strenuous with immobilizing, say in the cast. I might get more rigid with those. Or you have to consider some of their other medical comorbidities. What if you got somebody who's a poorly controlled diabetic, somebody who smokes, um, somebody who has osteoporosis, their bone may not be as good as a young healthy 20 year old's bone. You may need to protect those people more aggressively than you would um, that younger individual. And then that kind of goes down into the, the rigid versus relative stabilization. So are we using bracing and boot or, or cast like I talked about. So one of the more common injuries you're going to see are rotational injuries to the ankle. Now I threw in high energy injuries here. Um, this is more of an example of a high energy injury. You're not going to see this very often in a urgent care, primary care, um, even in an outpatient setting. These are going to be things that land in the emergency room. Um, this is from car accidents, this is from falls from height, uh, this is from industrial injuries. So a lot of these are going to land, say, at the trauma centers or, or um, you know, level one or level two trauma centers. Um, you may see them on occasion. If you're working in an ER or something like that, you may get one of these come in because you're the closest to ER. Uh, but the majority of these are going to go to higher level uh, hospitals uh, for evaluation. Low energy <coughs> fractures? you may see a lot of in an outpatient setting. So these are going to be things where folks will say, yeah, I missed the step on the curb. It's going to look similar to an ankle sprain, but you get an x-ray and you see this. Okay, so this one is a trimalleolar ankle fracture. So there's fractures of the fibula, medial malleolus, and then when you look at the lateral view, there's also a posterior malleolus fracture. Um, the ways that these injuries take place Low energy injuries are usually <coughs> rotation, same as the syndesmosis getting hurt, it's usually a rotational injury. And this classification called the Loggy Hansen classification actually describes these injuries um, by two things. Number one, what position the foot is in when it gets hurt, and then the external moment force that's applied to the foot. So you'll see that there's something called uh, supination adduction, supination external rotation, pronation abduction, and pronation external rotation. So what those refer to, the um, supination or the pronation is the position of the foot at the time of the injury. So whether that foot's inverted, which is supinated, or everted, which is pronated. And then the other word, adduction, abduction, or external rotation is the force that's applied to it. This model was created based off of cadaveric models but it applies pretty well. I would say 90% of low energy ankle fractures fall into one of these classifications. So it's a, it's a decent classification system. Um, your clinical evaluation of these, same as when we were looking at sprains. You're gonna see swelling, you're gonna see bruising. You may see significant deformity like this. So this is a, this is a dislocation. Um, and these are important things to 
recognize early because let's say this sits in an ER for a couple of hours and a compromised person, you may be staring at an ulcer in a hurry. So these are urgencies to get the foot lined back up grossly. Even if you're not going to be the person definitively treating that injury, you still need to treat it on an urgent emergent basis. And so if you have a malaligned foot like this, this is something that requires a closed reduction to try to get the alignment better. Um, radiographic evaluation, as before, we get a lot of x-rays of things. So we talked about um, alignment. Um, you can see here that the overall alignment of the ankle joint's okay, but you can still see that there is some angulation and displacement of these fractures. Uh, comminution, so this is a pretty good example of a little bit of comminution. So the fibula fracture, you can say, looks pretty clean, to you, for lack of a better word. It's not broken into a lot of different pieces. The medial malleolus, you can kind of see these little small giblets here. That's comminution. That's important because that indicates the degree of injury to the bone. Um, and then articular involvement. So this portion of this fracture involves the joint surface. You can see that it broke into where that joint lining in this portion of that tibia is coated with articular cartilage. So this has hurt the cartilage um, just by virtue of this type of injury happening. Um, conservative treatment of these. So let's say you've got a stable fracture. You're going to try to treat it conservatively. Limiting weight bearing once again. Limiting motion. So whether you're using a boot or a cast, any of those things. Um, and you're still treating this from an inflammation standpoint as well. You still want to get the inflammation down in these folks because number one, they're going to feel better. And number two, some people will have sequela related to inflammation. If you let swelling sit around um, on compromised skin for a while, you can start to run into some problems. Um, surgical treatment, as I said, those are the ones that are either um, too displaced to heal, articular incongruity, um, instability of the joints, and so the keys to this are reducing those fractures, so getting them lined up where you want them, maintaining that reduction, which is why you see a lot of hardware in our x-rays, and then compression. As I said, bone likes to heal under compression, so you got to get those pieces squeezed together, and that's why we use implants that allow for that compression, like partially threaded screws that allow you to get compression across those bones. So that kind of covers injuries. Are there, we'll kind of take a little hiatus here. Are there any questions about fractures, sprains, any of those types of things? Yes? Is there a general, I guess maybe it would depend on the fracture or sprain or strain, for how long you keep a patient in a boot if you're not doing surgery? Yes, so um, we know that on average, bone healing takes about 10 to 12 weeks. That is bone biology. Not much you can do to change that. And I argue that with patients on a daily basis. No, I mean, it's only it's gonna take, no, I heal fast. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be, no, no you won't. Uh, and then they'll also, well, can I use, you know, they've read about a bone stimulator or something like that. That might speed up the healing by a week or two. I mean, really on average, it takes about 10 to 12 weeks for an adult to heal a bony injury. Kids that are skeletally immature, it might take a little bit less. They'll heal in about eight to 10 weeks. Um, some fractures in a kid will even heal up to six weeks, but in an adult, you're looking at about 10 to 12 weeks. So in my practice, I'm usually immobilizing those fractures to some degree for about 10 weeks. Now, it's not going to be in a cast for 10 weeks all the time. Let's say we've got a stable fibula fracture. The joint's lined up perfect. There's no ligamentous injury. It's, it's not terribly displaced probably going to have that person in a boot for about four to six weeks. Um, and I use the boot to advance their weight bearing. So as soon as I'm comfortable getting weight bearing on that foot, I'll let them weight bear in the boot for about three to four weeks. At that point, even though the fracture may not be 100% healed, as long as it's showing some early signs of healing, which you can see on x-ray, by about six weeks, that's when you'll start to see callus formation or that immature bone model start to form. If you're seeing callus, you've got relative stability of that fracture. So you can usually get them out of the rigid immobilization and get them into the brace um, or something, you know, let's say it's a foot injury, get them into a stiff soled shoe, something that's still going to offer a little bit of support but not completely shut down their leg. That's where you'll also start that protected physical therapy to start working on the rehab. 
I'll do that until they're about 10 weeks out. When they're 10 weeks, if you're seeing that bone nearly completely healed, that's when I'll get them out of immobilization completely, get them back into regular footwear, regular activities. I still might not let them do high impact athletic activities though. It's usually most fractures for me, it's going to be upwards of three and a half to four months before I'm letting somebody run or jump or cut on that foot. Okay. So it, it varies and that's, that's a, a very general approach to it and you'll have variances and that depends on every patient, uh, not only fracture characteristics but uh, medical comorbidities, how much can you trust that person. That's a big deal. You know, I'll, I'll recommend all of these things to people and, you know, I'll say, okay, yeah, I want to see you back in four weeks. Um, that'll be six weeks out, and that's when we'll see about getting you in and out of the boot. They'll come back four weeks later, walking in in a shoe. When'd you get out of your boot? Oh, about three weeks ago. <laughs> okay. Um, so, it, you know, you have to get a sense of can you trust that person or not. And it's not an indictment on the patient because you know, this isn't their area of expertise. You're trying to help them with that, but they don't know those things. And so it's not that I'm mad at that person or that I'm thinking they're stupid by any means, it's just they don't know. And so you have to get a sense of how savvy that person is. Most people, when you sit down and explain all this to them for about five minutes, they're gonna say, okay, I get it, I'll protect this, I don't wanna do this again, and it'll be fine. Um, but that was, I know that was a roundabout way to answer that question. But. Was there another, I saw another hand in the back. Yes. I know you touched on some skin changes, but would mm -hmm. those be considered a fracture blister or what causes a fracture blister? So that's a good question. Fracture blisters are usually going to arise from higher energy injuries. Um, the reason you get fracture blisters, and more particularly in the lower extremity than other places, um, is because when you get a severe degree of swelling in the ankle particularly or in the foot that swelling only has limited places it can go well what will start to happen is that swelling will begin to push its way into the layers of the skin and that's where the blister comes from so that's a very critical thing because fracture blisters if not managed appropriately can all of a sudden turn into ulcers and that's a totally different problem. Now you've converted a closed injury into an open one, and that it's a, it puts you in a whole different, whole different category of complications. So uh, you will usually not see fracture blisters come up with low energy injuries. Not impossible, but you usually won't. You're usually going to see those more from a car accident or a fall from height those types of things with those severely comminuted injuries because it has everything to do with the amount of inflammation and bleeding that gets generated from the injury. Okay. My management of those, if I see somebody, let's say I saw somebody with that pilon, that distal tibial injury that was just looked like it was a thousand pieces, um, that person, if they come to me, say, three to five days after their injury, they're going to have fracture blisters. And so what I usually try to do there is you don't want that top layer of skin to slough. And so I'll take a little swab of betadine and clean off the skin, and then I will use a sterile 18-gauge needle and just nick that top layer and let that fluid drain out, but have that top layer of skin kind of suck back down to the underneath layers of skin, the dermal layers. And I'll put a non-adherent dressing on that because my goal is to not have that top layer of epidermis slough and leave exposed dermis. Um, you, can't, you can't make incisions through that skin safely because it, it won't suture back together very well. Um, and if the dermis gets exposed, the dermis is at a much higher risk of getting infected than epidermis is. So, I want at all costs to keep that top layer of skin intact um, and that's why I'll go ahead and drain them because if you let them sit they'll usually resolve but they take a while. It takes a while for your body to absorb all that fluid back into, into the deep layers. Okay. Good question. What other questions? Okay. Ready to move on to some more chronic things? So, um, talking about arthritis in general. Um, so what arthritis refers to is 
inflammation in the joint. That is the lateral translation of arthritis is, is joint inflammation. Um, but that joint inflammation can come from multiple causes. So this picture is, is a picture that tries to show you a degenerative type arthritis or primary arthritis, which is where you get wear and tear of the cartilage, whether that's um, just because of overuse, um, instability, something that has worn that cartilage away. And if you lose that articular cartilage, now instead of having smooth on smooth, you've got rough on rough and it's generating inflammation. The synovial lining is what makes the the fluid and the inflammation. That's where it comes from. Cartilage actually doesn't have blood supply, it doesn't have nerves. So that's not what causes the pain from arthritis. It's the bone that hurts and it's the inflammation that gets generated from the synovial lining. That's where the pain comes from. Um, so you can also get arthritis, say, if you have an inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis. So that's your body attacking itself and generating inflammation inside the joint. Um, Post-traumatic, so let's say you break your ankle into that joint and we fix your bone and your bone heals great, but that cartilage was damaged. Cartilage, we don't have the ability as humans to regrow smooth articular cartilage. We can grow cartilage substitute called fibrocartilage, which isn't quite as smooth or quite as strong, um, it's a decent substitute, but it's not the real thing. And so that's, that's kind of the biggest area of boom in orthopedics right now is biologics. How do we regrow cartilage and how do we get bone to heal better? That's where all the, all the money's being spent really right now. Um, Post-traumatic septic. So let's say you get an infection inside your joint and that infection causes cartilage damage results in the exact same symptoms as if you broke your knee or just had primary wear and tear arthritis. You just went about it a different way. Um, so there are 26 bones in the ankle, 33 joints. So each one of those joints can get arthritis. So lots of places where arthritis can affect you in the foot and the ankle. Um, this is an arthroscopic picture inside of an ankle. Um, that shows you kind of what that cartilage wear looks like. So if you look over here, this is where the cartilage looks remotely normal. If you actually look at cartilage, it's a pretty firm substance. Um, it's got a little bit of give because it's got a high water content. So it, it squishes a little bit, but it's, it's pretty stout. If you start seeing this kind of furry change to it, and then over here you can see where there's actually exposed bone. That's where that cartilage has been sheared or worn away from the bone. Um, and that's, this is a, a very good depiction of what arthritis is caused from. Like I said, the cartilage isn't what's causing the pain. Now the bone may be hurting, bone has nerve endings, but um, what's causing the pain is this irregular bearing surface that's generating inflammation. Clinical presentation of this may look very similar to some of the things that we've talked about already. These people are going to have swollen ankles and feet. Um, they're going to have limited and irregular motion. They're going to hurt. Now, the difference is when you talk to them about their history, they're not going to tell you that they injured it. They're going to say, oh, it's been going on for six months or a year. Or, yeah, I remember hurting my ankle back in you know 1980-some-odd, and I didn't really do anything about it, but it started to hurt me now. These are the things that you'll get about that. Um, when we look at x-rays um, of this, this is where you'll start to see some of those changes I was pointing out on the, the, the normal x-rays. So here you see joint space narrowing. So this is why weight-bearing x-rays are important in the setting of arthritis. If you x-ray this person sitting down, it's going to look totally different than if you get a weight-bearing x-ray. You might get an x-ray of this sitting down and it may look almost normal to you. But you get this x-ray with them bearing weight on it and you can see how that cartilage that makes up that joint space has been lost. Um, you'll see that subchondral sclerosis. So bone in general ought to have this kind of lacy, kind of grayish appearance on an x-ray. That's what normal bone looks like. You can see on this film how right underneath the joint surface on both of these bones, it's gotten a lot more bright. It's denser. Bone is a substance that reacts to stress, something called Wolf's Law. 
So if it gets stressed, it tries to build itself up. Well, if you remove the cartilage cushion from that bone, it's going to see more stress. So it's going to build itself up. So it'll start to get denser. And that's a finding that you can correlate on x-ray with arthritic changes. Bone spur formation. So you see these kind of hooks of bone coming around in different places. Bone, I always tell folks, bone's a pretty simple object. It knows how to do one of two things. It makes new bone and chews up old bone. So when it gets presented with inflammation or um, swelling or any of those types of things or the ligaments get irritated as they attach to the bone, it'll try to calcify that. Now in most cases it doesn't help, but it's something that you will see. That is a sign of inflammation in one way or another. Uh, this is a lateral view of that same ankle, so you're seeing just a significant amount of joint space narrowing, bone spur formation, subchondral sclerosis, um, all of those findings. <clears throat> I'll still try to treat most of these conditions conservatively initially. It is a rare thing that I have somebody come to me and the first time they see me I say, let's go do surgery on you. We're going to try conservative things more often than not because in a lot of cases, <laughs> These conditions can be treated conservatively and do just fine with, with those measures. Um, immobilization is important. We know that that bearing surface is altered, so when you move that joint, it causes pain. So if we keep that joint from moving, theoretically it hurts less. So let's say somebody's got ankle or hind foot arthritis. I'm going to put a lace-up brace on them because that's going to limit the motion when they're up and on this. Um, Anti-inflammatory medicines, hallmarks of arthritis treatment. Now, once again, like we said, we've got to be cautious in folks who have those other comorbid uh, conditions, but we use a lot of anti-inflammatories for this. Um, this is an area where we will inject joints. So this is taking steroid and in injecting it directly into the joint. This is particularly helpful for somebody who has one of those comorbid conditions, can't tolerate non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or somebody who's failed those things. This is kind of a middle step for me. If I've tried some of those conservative things and they failed, let's try injecting that joint, putting a little bit of steroid in. Yes? What's your opinion on limitations on injections? Do you have a certain number you'll do per person? Or? So it depends. Um, let's say you've got a joint that looks like that. Most of the cartilage is worn off. Um, I don't have a problem injecting this joint for a long time because the theoretic risk of an intraarticular steroid injection is weakening the cartilage. If your cartilage is already hurt, the horse is already out of the barn on that one. So, you know, that one doesn't bother me as much. My general rule of thumb, and most of us would argue that you shouldn't inject a joint more frequently than every three months. You should give it at least three months between intraarticular injections. Now, we'll hedge on those sometimes, you know, so 10 weeks somebody comes in and their injection form, okay, we can cheat a little bit. If you've got somebody that's got a pretty normal looking joint radiographically, that's when you want to be cautious. So let's say I've got a, you know, an athlete that has an osteochondral injury and we're just trying to inject it to see if we can calm it down. Well, if I inject that person, it gets better for four weeks, but then it comes back, I'm not injecting it again because I need to go in and do something to fix that cartilage so I don't want to weaken it anymore. This is a different story, though. Uh, now, folks that you have to be cautious with, diabetics particularly. I know it's going to sound like a theme for me, but <laughs> diabetics, you need to warn those people that when you inject them, they need to monitor their glycemic control for a few days because even an intraarticular injection, it's not a systemic administration. It'll still bump their sugars for a few days, so they need to watch it. Okay. Um, and you can inject just about any one of those joints in the foot. Um, some of these joints I inject without any um, imaging assistance. I can hit an, uh, an ankle joint pretty easily without any guidance. I can hit a subtalar joint pretty easily without any guidance. You start getting into these more um, narrow and smaller joints into the midfoot and the forefoot. That's when I call my partners, uh, Dr. Matt Verifu, who we talked to a few days ago, um, to do this under ultrasound guidance to make sure we're getting it in the right place. Um, when we talk about surgery for arthritis, um, there's three main things that I tend to do for any arthritic joint in the foot and the ankle. So let's say you have a joint that's early arthritis, it's got some bone spurs, you think the bone spurs are what's causing the pain from either impingement when they move that joint or stretching on the joint lining, but overall the joint still looks pretty good. 
you might go in and do just an isolated debridement or what's called a chylectomy where you get rid of the bone spurs. Now, you have to counsel the patient at that point that this isn't going to make your arthritis go away. Um, all we're trying to do is buy some relief to prevent you from needing one of these more aggressive treatments sooner. Okay, so they may still go on to need something more aggressive, but if you can put that off for a little bit, especially in younger individuals, that's a benefit in a lot of instances because some of these treatments, joint replacements, you can't do in every patient, especially younger ones. Um, so you want to try to buy them time. Um, this is also, uh, you know, you saw the arthroscopic picture. So for an ankle or subtalar joint, I might do an arthroscopic procedure to debride that joint, try to clean out some of that inflammation or synovial tissue that's there. Um, Fusion is a hallmark of arthritis treatment in the foot and the ankle. It's the gold standard for most arthritic joints. And so the theory behind fusion is if we eliminate that joint, we eliminate the source of the discomfort. So what you're doing with the fusion is you open that joint up, you get rid of everything left of the cartilage that's there, you, for lack of a better term, chisel up the bone a little bit to make it think that it's broken and that it needs to heal, and you add some bone graft there, and then you lock it together, compress it, so that it thinks it's broken and needs to do more fracture healing. And so this is an ankle fusion, um, and you see I've got screws spanning that joint to compress it. There's no space anymore. Um, this lady is on this x-ray is about so eight weeks out from her fusion, so she's not 100% healed yet. You can see some little lucencies here, but you also see some areas where it's starting to look like one solid piece of bone. Uh, if we go back to this picture, so this guy's got ankle arthritis. He also had a subtalar fusion at some point in the past, so you can see that there's no subtalar joint anymore. It just looks like one solid piece of bone. Okay. Now, there's certainly disadvantages to fusions. Um, we know that when we do a fusion, we're sacrificing motion. Um, a lot of these people with these joints don't have a whole lot of motion to begin with. Um, and in most cases, you're not going to regain motion with joint replacements. Not to mention, we can't replace every joint in the foot and the ankle. There's really only one joint that we consistently do replacements for in the foot and the ankle. Um, that's a little bit different than say, obviously we can replace knees, we can replace hips, uh, we can replace shoulders, elbows. The only joint in the foot and the ankle that I replace is the ankle. Um, you will maybe hear of replacements of the big toe joint. You can get into a philosophical argument about that. I don't think they work. I think they're poorly designed. I think they're mechanically flawed, uh, but you may see it at some point. Um, but I think the only joint in the foot and the ankle that has reliable results with a replacement is the ankle, and this is an ankle replacement. Um, and so what we've done with this is we've taken away those diseased portions of bone and replaced them with metal components, and then the gap is a polyethylene insert that serves as the new bearing surface. Okay. Um, but those are kind of the three main operative treatments that you would do. A fusion, I can fuse any joint in the foot. So if we go back to, you know, this guy's x-ray, he's got a little bit of talonavicular arthritis. Um, let's see <coughs> some of our other x-rays. Um, you know, any of these midfoot joints, I just fused a second TMT joint this morning. So any of these joints can get arthritis and fusion tends to be the the go-to treatment for end-stage arthritis. Let's go back to where we were here. Um, so that kind of covers arthritis. Any questions before we move on from arthritis? Okay. So other things can get inflamed in the foot and the ankle as well. Um, one of the most common ones that you're going to see is plantar fasciitis. Almost everybody's had plantar fascia problems at some point. Um, it's one of the most common things I see in the office. I see it at least three or four times a day. Um, and then I also see a significant amount of tendinopathy, which will break that into some different categories as well. Plantar fascia, so this is a, a very um, elementary um, diagram, but it shows it decently what the plantar fascia is. It is a very long, broad ligament that spans the entire plantar surface of the foot. Its main job is to support the longitudinal arch. Um, the only 
thing that is inaccurate about this diagram is that, and it has implications on how we treat it, the plantar fascia doesn't just originate from the calcaneus. The Achilles tendon doesn't just come in and plug into the heel bone. The Achilles tendon makes a big sleeve around the backside of the heel bone and continues on the plantar surface of the foot as the plantar fascia. It's all one big layer of tissue. So a lot of folks who have problems with one will have problems with the other. So that's something to keep in mind. The plantar fascia um, usually gets irritated when it gets tight. It's like most things in the body, they like to live in a nice stretched out position. And when it gets tight, it gets irritated. Um, and when it gets tight, it sustains multiple repetitive micro traumas. You get all these little micro tears in that ligament. Those tears heal with scar tissue. Scar tissue isn't as flexible as a normal ligament is, which makes the ligament tighter, which makes it more prone to micro tears. Vicious cycle that that south folks end up in your office saying, "Yeah, it's been going on for six months. It's just not getting better." Um, the clinical presentation of this goes along with that. So, very commonly, folks will come in telling you, "You know what? This actually bothers me more if I've been sitting down for a while," which is contrary to most orthopedic problems. Most people, when they have an orthopedic problem, are, oh yeah, it hurts when I walk, hurts when I run. Plantar fascia problems are the, usually the opposite. Now they'll certainly have their pain if, let's say, if they work on a hard surface or walk a lot. Yeah, it'll start to hurt throughout the day. But most of these people will actually complain of morning pain, first step out of bed pain, or yeah, it's when I, it's pretty good during the day, but when I go home at night and I sit down and then I get up to go to the kitchen, that's when it kills me. The reason for that is when we sleep or when we sit down, our feet naturally relax down into this plantar flex position. That allows that whole unit to shorten it gets tight and then when you go to get up and you pull your foot up to take a step micro traumas to the ligament stirs up the inflammation and you're off and running from there um, the majority of the time folks will have pain in this distribution right here this is over the medial side of the hind foot it's not as common on the direct bottom part of the heel it's usually on the medial side now my caution there to you though you can have pain all along that plantar fascia ligament. I see plenty of folks who come in with mid-substance pain. Um, but if you look at the textbook answer of where this should have hurt, it's the medial side of the hind foot. Okay. Um, and a lot of these people are going to be stiff. Whether it's overall stiffness of their Achilles, um, whether it's an isolated gastrocnemius contracture, which is where that silver skull test that we did earlier comes into play, because that gastrocnemius contracture can cause plantar fascia problems. Um, whether it's because I treated them in a boot for six weeks for their ankle sprain, and now we're getting them out of it, but their heel hurts worse than their ankle did, because they were kept stiff for six weeks. There's multiple reasons you can end up with this problem. Um, X-rays of this, Usually they don't help you very much, although they can aid in your diagnosis. So if you see this osteophyte on the bottom of the heel bone, that's usually an indicator that there has been some inflammation of that plantar fascia at some point. Now, folks will always come into your clinic saying, yeah, I've got heel spurs. That's where the pain's coming from. The pain doesn't come from the bone. The pain's coming from the ligament. So even when I go in and do surgery for this problem, I don't take out the bone spur. All I do is deal with the ligaments. So that's kind of an important thing. It's something to know because almost every patient that comes into me with a plantar fascia problem says, I got heel spurs. The heel spur hurts me. It's not the heel spur. Um, plantar fasciitis, 95% of the time, we get it better with conservative things. It's a definite rarity that I get folks to the OR for this problem. Um, the main thing to do for this problem is stretching. So there's stretching protocols and massage techniques that I think are very important for this. Um, this one over here is the most effective stretch you can do, um, which is a standing wall stretch. And you'll know that this is stretching not only the plantar fascia, but the calf. It's stretching everything. Um, and then I also have folks do this plantar fascia massage where you're manually stretching out and breaking up that scar tissue. Um, this is something I always tell patients, it seems really simplistic, um, but it works. The only way it works though is if you do it consistently throughout the day. When I tell people to do this, I tell them they need to do these stretches four times a day at a minimum. So it, it takes some diligence to get it better. 
Um, Anti-inflammatory medicines can be helpful for this. Night splinting is something that we will use commonly for this, especially for those folks that have first step out of bed pain. So what this device does is it keeps your foot up in a neutral position while you sleep. It's trying to head off some of that inflammation that gets generated first thing in the morning when you take that first step out of bed. Um, injections, we will inject this uh, plantar fascia very commonly. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're, you're trying to target and bathe that ligament in the steroid. It's not like a joint where you just have to get it inside the joint, you kind of have to disperse it around that ligament. Um, it's not the most enjoyable injection to get. Um, so, but I do it pretty frequently and most people who are ready for that, they don't care what you have to do to get this pain to go away. Um, there are some other more aggressive treatments that are, are probably a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but um, these are, I'd say, nine times out of ten, we get this better with this protocol. If they're not better after this, that's when we start talking about more aggressive things. Yes? How long do they have to do these fetching massages four times a day? So what I will tell people is that at minimum of six weeks, and that's usually the time it takes to at least see if we're moving the needle at all, if we're at least making some improvement. I will make folks fail conservative treatment for four to six months before we get to surgery. Yes? I'm guessing once you get it, there's a high chance of it coming back. Not necessarily. You'd be surprised. Um, a lot of folks, once we get it to go away, it stays away. Now, some of that depends on maintenance. I always tell people, once we get it better, don't stop your stretching. You may not need to do it four times a day, but you need to at least stretch daily. Um, because if you stop completely, the, the, the tightness is the culprit. All right, so to go along with that, Achilles tendinopathy. Um, the Achilles tendon is a little bit different. So you can get isolated inflammation around the tendon or you can have degenerative change of the tendon that causes dysfunction. Um, when I think of Achilles tendinopathy, I usually break this up into insertional and non-insertional tendinopathies. These are two different animals. So when we talk about insertional, that's the picture on the right over here. Um, this is commonly caused by uh, I would say overuse. Um, I would argue just about anybody over the age of 40 has some insertional Achilles tendinopathy. Um, you will also see irritation of the tendon at its insertion as a result of um, bony anomalies. There's something called a Haglund's lesion, which is a little bony prominence on the back of the heel bone that can cause irritation of the tendon um, as it's tightened against it. Um, Insertional Achilles tendinopathy makes up probably 80 to 90 percent of the Achilles tendinopathy I see. Um, Non-insertional tendinopathy um, is where you will get this kind of knot or thickened area up in the middle of the Achilles tendon. It's a little bit of a different animal. It doesn't um, arise usually from irritation from the bone or anything of that nature. Um, it can be degenerative or wear and tear type tendinopathy. But I see a lot of folks who get this earlier. I see a lot of younger people with non-insertional tendinopathy. Um, clinical presentation, you'll see, I mean, this is a broken record for me, swelling, pain, limited range of motions, all the same things as you see for all these other injuries. But the radiographic evaluation is a little bit different. So this is a good depiction of some insertional tendinopathy. So remember when we talked about arthritis and bone spurs forming. Achilles tendon gets wear and tear and inflammation, bone's responding to that. It's calcifying that inflamed or worn and torn tendon. This is a good depiction of the Haglund's lesion. So ideally, the back of the heel bone ought to look something like that. So this extra prominence up here can act as an irritator as that tendon gets pulled tight when the foot's in dorsiflexion. Um, and then you can also, you'll see a lot of these folks have MRIs, and this is a pretty good uh, illustration of the Achilles tendon ought to look like this, how it looks up high. So this is a sagittal image, and you see the Achilles tendon, which is this dark structure in the back. And you see as it gets down lower, it starts to flare, that's abnormal. In a normal person, it will look exactly like this down here. You also see all this bright signal around the tendon, that's inflammation. You see bright signal within the tendon, that's degenerative change of that tendon. 
the way to think of this tendon, it's a, it's like a fiber optic cable. It's a big rope with lots of little well-organized ropes on the inside. And so what usually happens here, the whole tendon's not tearing in two, but those little ropes are, are tearing or popping and they're healing with scar tissue, which is disorganized and it allows that tendon to expand, but it also makes it less efficient. Um, same thing as plantar fascia, I always start with conservative treatment for Achilles tendinopathy. Um, those same stretches that we did for plantar fasciitis will oftentimes help insertional tendinopathy. This is a stretching protocol called an eccentric stretching protocol, which has been found to be particularly effective for non-insertional tendinopathy. So you treat these a little bit differently. Um, some folks, if they come in with just rip roaring inflammation, I'll put them in a boot for a little while to calm that inflammation down. Anti-inflammatories, this is a good place, and the foot's a good place in general. We, we've talked a lot about oral anti-inflammatories. Topical anti-inflammatories can be useful down here too. The foot is basically skin and bone, so all the things you're trying to get medicine to are very superficial. Um, so we use a lot of topical, either patches or ointments down here in the foot and the ankle. Um, I will put shoe lifts in the backs of these folks shoes. Anything you can do to offload or relax that Achilles tendon back away from the heel bone and do some of its job for it. Only when they failed those treatments after a few months do we start talking about surgical treatment. And the surgical treatment for this varies. So for insertional tendinopathy, we're usually going in and taking out that worn and torn tendon, getting rid of the bony prominence and then reattaching the Achilles back down. Uh, sometimes you don't have enough tendon left to repair and so you have to do what's called tendon transfers where we borrow other tendons and muscles from the back of the foot to help the Achilles. Um, sometimes for non-insertional tendinopathy, I'll do an, what's called an isolated gastric nemus recession, which is where we just lengthen the calf muscle a little bit to take the tension off the tendon. So it, it depends. There's not one book answer for this. It kind of depends on the clinical situation. Um, posterior tibial tendinopathy. So posterior tibial tendon we mentioned early in the exam portion is the uh, main inverter of the hind foot. It also supports the longitudinal large every step you take. So this tendon sees incredible stress on a daily basis. Um, usually when folks are coming in with this problem, um, it's a degenerative condition for me. In isolated cases, you'll see a traumatic injury to the posterior tip, but nine times out of 10 for me, it's degenerative, it's, it's wear and tear. Um, and what happens is not only does it get inflamed and painful, but then it doesn't work as efficiently. And so if it's not working as well, it's set to be in opposition of the perineal tendons on the opposite side. Those balance each other out. If the posterior tip's not working, but the perineals are still working, now all of a sudden that's where you start to get arch collapse or a flexible flat foot and that's the most common manifestation of untreated posterior tibial tendinopathy. So on clinical exam, still see all those same things, isolated swelling, um, pain with weight bearing, but this is where you'll start to see some hind foot deformities. So this person, right side looks pretty normal, left side has increased hind foot valgus, collapse of the longitudinal arch, swelling over the medial side of the ankle. This is something called a too many toes sign. Um, I don't pay attention to that as much as the fact that you see just an obvious hind foot valgus malalignment there, but that too many toes sign is an indicator that the foot is abducting and collapsing through the arch. When we look at x-rays of these, um, you will see that abduction um, on an AP view of the foot. So the navicular should line up directly over the tailored head. So you can see how it is turned off through the transverse tarsal joint. Um, if you look at the lateral view, if you remember some of those other laterals we looked at where it looked like there was an actual arch, this one's collapsed all the way down to the ground. Okay. So this is an instance of where this has been going on for a while to get to this point. And eventually, if this goes unchecked, you can get to a point where you have arthritic changes in those hind foot joints. So the staging uh, system for posterior tibial tendinopathy goes through no deformity, flexible deformity, rigid deformity, and then eventually if it gets bad enough, you can cause strain of the deltoid ligament and the ankle will start to collapse actually. So that's kind of the progression of how this moves. Um, 
Usually, same thing. Treatment is going to be non-operative right off the bat. We're going to brace this. The bracing options for this involve something called a, uh, an airlift brace. It looks like the normal lace-up brace that I use for other things, but it's got a little um, air bladder in the bottom of the arch that you can pump air into, and it helps to elevate that arch, so it's giving the posterior tibial tendon some help. Um, orthotics are actually, this is one of the areas where I do use some orthotics, so you can do some longitudinal arch supports to help support that arch and rest the posterior tibial tendon. Um, physical therapy can be helpful for this, so using PT to try to strengthen that posterior tibial tendon muscle, make it work more efficiently, anti-inflammatories. When it comes to surgery for this problem, there's really two main options. You can either try to do something reconstructive or something um, along the lines of effusion. So this is a a reconstruction here where what we've done is made osteotomies or bone cuts in the heel bone to realign the hind foot so to take it out of valgus as well as do a bone cut to try to bring that forefoot out of abduction and then we usually also do a tendon transfer so if that posterior tibial tendon is diseased you have to do something to, to make that hind foot work again and so we borrow the long flexor to the toes and have it try to do that new job by transferring it into the navicular. Um, if you get to the point where the deformity is rigid or you have arthritis, that's where we get to fusion. So same as in the ankle, this is called a triple arthrodesis where we have fused those three joints in the back of the foot in normal alignment. So you're not only correcting deformity, but you're dealing with arthritis at the same time. So the last thing that we'll get to, and I think we're getting close to the time here, so diabetic implications on the foot and the ankle. Um, diabetes is going to be something that if you're seeing folks um, either for their diabetes, you have to pay attention to their feet and vice versa. If you're seeing feet and ankles, you're going to see diabetic problems. Um, it happens for multiple reasons, but the main culprit, that poor glycemic control, impairs sensory function and it impairs vascular function. So neuropathy is a big problem in folks who have diabetes. It's not just a symptom. So if you can't feel the bottom of your foot, you can't tell that you've stepped on something or worn a sore in the bottom of your foot or started to develop Charcot arthropathy and your foot's collapsing underneath you, you just you don't know. Um, the impaired vascular function, we know that poor glycemic control causes micro and macrovascular um, disease. If you don't have blood flow that's adequate, you can't heal wounds, you can't heal bones. Um, you can't do micro repairs to those bones and tendons on a daily basis. It just causes all sorts of problems. Um, ulcerations are going to be one of the most common things you'll see in the diabetic population when it comes to foot and ankle problems. And, and like I said, this is usually as a result of neuropathy. You know, you have a person who can't feel their foot, uh, and, and you'd look at this and say, oh my gosh, how do you get to this point where you have a gaping hole in your foot? Well, they can't feel it. Um, so. When you're seeing your diabetic patients, you have to tell them if they have neuropathy, they have to look at their feet every day. It's, the, it's just non-negotiable. Um, and if you start to notice calluses or pre-ulcerations, if you intervene at that time, they're very simple solutions. You get to this point, this is the person who spends six months in wound care to get this to heal. It's a, it's a tough problem. Um, and it's a double whammy. It's not just the fact that they can't feel it, but they don't have good blood flow, so they're slow to heal it too. And as long as that ulcer is there, that's a potential source for infection. You get an infection in a foot like this, it becomes a limit threatening condition right away. I mean, that this is, this is not to say that every person that has this picture ends up in that instance, but this is where amputations start, is here. Um, Charcot arthropathy is a particular thing that is um, unique to folks with neuropathy. It's not just something that occurs in diabetics, but it just so happens that the most common cause of neuropathy in the United States is diabetes. So they do kind of go hand in hand in, in most of our practices. Um, what you see in Charcot arthropathy, it is at its base a form of arthritis. But it's kind of a, it's a bad actor. 
you, when you look at x-rays of these folks, you can see that you start to get these bizarre appearances to these joints. Nothing lines up. And you look at this and you say, oh man, if I just looked at this x-ray and didn't know anything about the patient, the two things I would have in my mind would be this person dropped a I-beam on their foot or they have Charcot arthropathy. Um, you just get these x-rays that look horrific. It oftentimes gets confused with infection too. These folks will show up in the ER with a warm, swollen foot and automatically they get started on IV antibiotics and sometimes they don't even get an x-ray. They got an x-ray, you'd see this and you'd know this is Charcot, this isn't an infection. And it's critical because you treat them differently. Um, if you try to treat this as an infection because the foot looks red and swollen and warm, you're gonna have that person on antibiotics, but they're still gonna be walking on it. And it's not gonna get better. This requires you to get people off their foot. You have to limit their weight bearing with something like this because when the bone starts to crumble like this in Charcot, it's, I can tell you, I've operated on Charcot bones before, they're like butter. I mean, it just falls apart in your hands. It's, it's amazing. So you have to get the weight off of these feet. So you either put them on crutches or even, a, I mean, I go as far as to put people in wheelchairs if I have to. You do whatever you have to do to get their weight off the foot. Um, this is the lateral view of that same patient. It's not quite as impressive because it's not a weight-bearing view, but what you can see is you've just lost all of those joints in the midfoot here. Um, this is a great clinical picture of what Charcot looks like. So, like I said, it gets mistaken for infection in the acute phase because there's a ton of inflammation. You can imagine with all of that bony destruction and joint inflammation, it's going to look like this. But the initial thought is, oh man, red hot foot, it's infected. It's not always the case. Um, one of the more common places to get Charcot is in the midfoot, and that's where you'll start to see this rocker bottom deformity. So instead of having a bony arch, you've seen complete collapse of that arch. These are the people who are at very particular risk to get ulcerations because the foot's designed to work like a tripod. Big toe, fifth toe, and heel, those are the areas that are designed to see load. If you invert that, that skin is not designed to see load. And if those people are walking on this foot, it's going to ulcerate without question. Um, so the, the treatment for Charcot, like I said, you catch these people in the acute phase, you got to get them off their foot. Absolutely have to have them non-weight bearing and you need to immobilize them. Um, you need to treat it like the most aggressive fracture treatment you can. Um, usually what I tell folks is if we can get your foot shoeable, braceable, and without ulcerations, we can treat your Charcot conservatively. We don't have to do surgery. So once we get that acute inflammation to settle down and get the bones to heal and stabilize, if we can get them back into an extra depth shoe, get them into a brace that will support their hind foot and keep them from developing ulcers, you don't have to do anything other than that. If you can't accomplish all three of those goals, that's when you get to surgery. Um, and usually, uh, this is a picture of something called a crow boot, which is a Charcot uh, range of motion uh, walking uh, device and so what this does this is basically like a removable cast um, it's not the sexiest looking thing in the world, but if it allows you to keep your foot most people will buy into that um, these are orthotics made out of plastizote, which is a very squishy, uh, accommodative material. So people who have calluses or prominences, you can have um, these types of orthotics um, have recesses built into them to try to offload those areas. These are, most orthotics inserts for shoes are not covered by insurances. This is the exception. If you have a diabetic patient, especially on Medicare, um, they will cover at least three sets of these a year. Uh, because these wear out after about three to four months, that plastizo will start to squish down. But what insurance companies have figured out is that if they spend a couple hundred bucks three times a year on these folks, they won't have to spend $20,000 on a baloney amputation and a prosthesis that they have to replace every few years. So 
this that's one place where insurance companies have recognized that yeah let's spend a little bit of money on the front end and we can prevent some of these bad things um, this is that same guy that I showed earlier so this patient here who had this just bad collapse of all of these midfoot bones this is what he ended up getting um, was this big midfoot fusion we had to use a big uh, cadaveric piece of bone to fill the void from where he had lost bone stock usually in Charcot you're having to do um, large-scale fixation and lots of bone graft because you have bone loss um, so that's that's his uh, that's his story there um, and like I said you know it's not everybody that gets to amputation but those those conditions unchecked and untreated they're going to get there. They're going to get there. So you have to be vigilant on this. All right. It's a lot of ground. Uh, yeah, the girls, that's uh, Catherine, that's Camden, they're twins. They're six. And that's uh, Charlie, he's three. This picture is about a year old. So All right. What questions? Any other questions? Probably not at 5 o'clock. <laughs> Good. Well, yeah, if you come up with questions, I'll leave, uh, Sally's got my contact information. I mean, if you guys have questions about this stuff, I don't mind you emailing me or, you know, sending me questions about things. Um, that's fine. I'm certainly happy to help in any way. Um, I appreciate you guys having, having me out to talk. Hopefully it was uh, helpful for you. Yeah. Thank you.